Um, remarkably, uh, the, the speakers have all been great. They've all kept the time, which means we've got plenty of time for questions. So I'm, re I'm really pleased about that. Um, I, I'm, maybe everybody has a think about that. I'm going to I'm going to have a first stab at a question. Um, jet, the, the, the price of fossil fuels is, is basically fallen through the floor. How does that affect the various technologies and businesses we've heard about uh, in your presentations? How worried are you, I suppose, is the... <laughs> um, I'll start on that one, being fossil fuel <coughs> company. Um, we're really pleased um, at the drop in fossil fuel prices. It's great news for, um, for the industry. It's great news for motorists. We've already seen the cost of LPG at the pump come down, probably from 70p, maybe this time last year per litre. Like I said, we're now down around 60p, probably going to drop further. Um, there are some refueling stations already where, with it starting with a five. Um, and we see that trend continuing. Um, I think no one predicted the crash. Anyone that tells you that they did, um, they should come work for Cala because we would have loved to have known about it in advance. Um, and no one knows how long it's going to last and where it's going to go. So I think it's something to be aware of. Um, I don't think it's a long-term drop, um, but certainly while it is, there's good savings to be made for, for consumers. Well, that's, that's some of the electric people who might have a different <laughs> perspective. Yeah, um, I, I think this is just the reality of the world that we live in, and it's um, important to recognize that this is a crash, and then there'll be a rise, and then there'll be another crash, and then there'll be another rise, and I think it just exposes the the problem that we have with our kind of over uh, over dependence on fossil fuels, uh, such a key sort of cornerstone of our economy. So I don't think it, when you're talking about transformations as 2050, I don't think it materially has that big an impact. Um, I also would probably point out to the fact that um, buying a car is perhaps one of the least economically rational decisions that we make in our life. Um, and when you know uh, fossil fuel prices were at uh, unprecedented highs people weren't then saying, well, it's obvious that people are going to switch to low emission vehicles. So I, I don't really see it as being that big an issue in the short to medium term. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, the experience tends to suggest that when people decide to buy an electric vehicle, it's quite a, it, it's a more rational car buying decision in that they do seem to think about it quite seriously and think about it on a long term basis. So I think, you know, that the change in fossil fuel prices is, um, perhaps regarded as a bit of a blip rather than a, a long-term problem. Slightly different perspective, uh, perhaps from, from the, the local authority side. And particularly, you know, the first thing that happened, obviously, was politicians came and asked us how much money we're now going to save on our fuel bills and in terms of our bitumen purchase for doing uh, road maintenance. Um, thankfully, we do know how much that contributes towards those overall um, costs to actually doing the work we do, and it's not as much as you would think. It tends to be wages that tend to be the thing, you know, and depreciation of vehicles, etc. So that the, there will be you know, a short-term issue. What we do know is when we do an assessment of wider transport networks and do modelling, etc., that the, the sensitivity to fuel price requires much more than what we've just seen. You know, before you'll actually get that behaviour change. When you when you plug that into, into your modelling, you probably have to increase the fuel price quite considerably you know, more than we've seen even in the last three, four years or, or more before you will get a, a, a shift in terms of the mode that people will be prepared to, to move to. Um, in terms of, well, I'm now going to leave my private vehicle at home, I'm going to move to, to rail or bus or not travel at all or active travel. Um, so, that, you know, now we may need to revisit that in terms of some of the transport economics we do um, and how we do go about that modelling. But that's, you know, that's a real thing that we try to build in when you actually look at what type of networks you're going to develop. And it would be remiss of me to, to mention, of course, I've given my home patch as Aberdeenshire. Um, it does have a downside in terms of individual communities in the short term as well, uh, in terms of the, the, how that impacts within individual communities. Um, so. Okay, um, we'll open up to the floor now. Uh, there's a question <coughs> still back there. Um, it's three questions, actually. Uh, the okay. first one is for David. Um, it was just a question about tax breaks for electric vehicles um, to make them less prohibitively expensive. Uh, I bought a car last year and it was £7,000 versus £26,000 and there was just no contest. I had to go for the fossil fuel-based one. Um, and the second two questions are for Holly. Uh, the first one is, will biopropene be um, a, a available at the, your LPG fueling stations? Um, and with your LNG and CNG, um, do you consider sourcing this through unconventional means such as fracking? 
It might be an, it might be an ignorant question because you might not be able to get these from unconventional means, but it's a question nonetheless. Okay. So we start with that last question then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, so we've been watching the shale gas fracking debate with, with a great deal of interest. Um, from Cala's point of view, we're not a quadrilla, we're not a, um, a gas extractor. We buy product from wherever it's available. Um, so whether that is from abroad, whether it's from indigenous supply through our UK refineries. With regards to is LPG or LNG CNG produced through fracking, the answer is yes. Um, whether we would buy any of that, um, we haven't made any commercial decisions on that yet. The fracking isn't happening um, in Britain at the moment. So, you know, that, that's a decision to be made at a time if that does go ahead. I think it's fair to say we're very aware of the environmental impacts that could happen and our position on fracking would always be that the environmental um, concerns must be addressed before anything can take place. Having said that, we are seeing product coming out of North America as a result of shale gas and it is pushing prices down. So I think there is a, um, a debate to be had there between the um, potential environmental impacts and can those be mitigated and are we confident that there are no adverse effects from fracking compared with can we buy a product that is lower in price. And I think you have to take the, all of those considerations into account. Um, as I said, no commercial decisions have been taken yet or will be taken until there's a lot more information on the table um, about fracking in, in the UK. Um, moving on to the biopropane issue, um, so it will be available um, at the end of 2016. We're currently investigating the various markets. Obviously, we have a heating business and we have a transport business. Um, the RTFO, which the Westminster government has confirmed to put in place, makes the economic case for putting biopropane into transport sector far more attractive than it does to putting it into the domestic or commercial heating um, markets. So at the moment, certainly I'd say there's a very strong possibility that biopropane will be available through our um, refilling stations um, as of the end of 2016. And what will, there, will there be a choice and what will there be a price difference when, when that's available? There shouldn't be. Um, obviously, I can't sit here and promise anything on pricing um, today for something that's you know three years in the future, two years in the future. What the RTFO does is it covers the differential in price. So to produce biopropane for us to bring it into the country, there is an increased shipping cost, there is an increased production cost. And I don't believe that today consumers would be willing, or many consumers would be willing to pay an increased cost for that green um, product. So we are very much looking to bring it in at a price point that is competitive with existing LPG supplies. And the RTFO should um, enable us to be able to do that. Okay, and tax breaks for electric vehicles. Yeah, um, there are purchase incentives, there are tax breaks, there are um, measures in place to make it f more financially attractive to, uh, to buy an electric vehicle today. Um, I think they're probably short to medium term measures. I think a sign of success is when we no longer have those in place and, and part of what will drive that is that the price of the vehicles will come down. I think we have to recognise that we're talking about first generation technologies and with first generation technologies comes the associated sort of inflated R&D costs and development costs associated with those technology. So I do expect prices will decline. Um, I'm sorry I didn't catch the lady's name, but and I'm sure she did her, her maths, but one of the things that we're finding is that um, the way that people buy electric vehicles is different to how they buy normal vehicles when they're looking at the economics. Um, so the upfront purchase price might be higher, uh, but the, the, the operational costs uh, so the fuel savings that you make and the, the negli negligible maintenance costs compared to what is a very complex um, internal combustion engine type setup which with infinite capacity to go wrong and break compared to a very simplistic motor driving uh, wheels means that the running costs from electric vehicles can be an order of magnitude lower. So actually people are starting, well we're encouraging people to look at the lifetime costs of owning an electric vehicle rather than just the initial purchase price that they make. And the final point to that is just go back to the point that buying a car is not an economically rational decision. If it was, we would all be driving around in really small, plain, boring cars. We don't buy cars <laughs> solely on purchase price. There are a whole range of other factors that we throw into the mix when we're buying cars. And final, final point is we're also looking at other ways of making owning an electric vehicle more attractive, so local incentives that we can have in cities, affording people sort of privileged access to parts of the cities where... Uh, other cars can't go through low emission zones with privileged parking, free parking, free charging.
or mix of measures that can make it more attractive to an own an EV. I've got a quick supplemental question for, for you. I mean, obviously, Scots and the, some of your authorities have bought a lot of, um, of these vehicles. You, what's driving that? What's the main incentive? Well, firstly, as, as local authorities, we're, we're fully signed up in terms of commitments under carbon reduction mm -hmm. plans, and it's you identifiable within a local authority that a large proportion, the two biggest things that, that drive our emissions profile are the transport issue, particularly if you're a big uh, rural authority where there's lots of transport involved, and if you have a very large building stock in terms of so those two bits. So therefore, that, that's, that drives the need to move uh, to alternative fuels and it's, it's interesting that in terms of the mix across the 32 authorities, we're very aware of Dundee City Council and the work they've done. Um, it's a very compact authority, it's an urban authority. Um, they've taken good advantage of, of the available finance and, and you know, we're watching that quite closely to see how that can be done elsewhere. Colleagues in Glasgow who were talking earlier today, um, you know, on the back of Commonwealth Games, a large influx of electric vehicles. So a, a, a very large number, I think, were put into the fleet and that will continue. And, and I think as the graph showed, we're on that curve in terms of you know, where we go. The, one of the big issues that we do have to take into account is replacement profiles for the vehicles we have and access then to the, to the funds. Um, if you replace a, a vehicle which is carrying out um, you know, the waste function in terms of the, the picking up and the redistributing waste, they're meant to last between nine and 12 years. Um, now they tend to be, they, if they're in an urban environment, yes, you probably could use any one of the technologies that we've talked about today already. But if an authority's just shelled out 150,000 pounds per vehicle this year, which my authority has, then it might be another nine years before we actually move to a, a replacement cycle. So there's, there's a whole range of things we have to balance across individual authorities uh, to see how we move towards a, that 2050 target of having a, a, a vehicle fleet within the public sector that's zero emissions. Is, and is there any particular incentives for uh, batteries? Because that's the other, at the, the, the moment, <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I'll we'll move on then. One word <laughs> answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll take it. We'll take another question uh, right at the back there. Can you give it your name, please? Gary Bell from Blackheath, Interesting that 68% uh, of journeys are less than five miles. But um, rather than bang on about how great bicycles are, really, I'd like to look at the excellent initiative in Edinburgh of virtually the entire city becoming a 20 mile an hour zone. And I'd like to get the opinion of the panel members <coughs> on the absolute benefits of a 20 mile an hour zone, reducing emissions, making places quieter and nicer to be in. And how in your roles you're able to contribute towards that. I didn't plan that question, honest. <laughs> uh, I didn't. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that's an, interest, uh, uh, an interesting topic given where we are today, so I'll open up to the panel. Then got a view on this? I think 20 mile an hour zones are great if you can't get rid of cars altogether. Um, I, I'm not sure whether what we're doing specifically in relation to uh, EVs and charging makes an awful lot of, it is something that could contribute to that. I think what's, what's interesting in what we're doing is um, looking at how you can use the location of charging infrastructure to redirect where people travel. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a sort of whole new potential element to the, the traffic planning which, which could uh, perhaps have a positive benefit and contribute to that in terms of just starting to influence where people park and charge their EVs and start to get them to use additional routes. But um, no, I mean, I, I think we should just get rid of cars from city centres. But that doesn't comply with the, the, the speech this morning about smart cities and scrambled egg. Mm -hmm. so. um, I think what I would say on um, 20 mile an hour zones is, again, uh, fully support them for city centres. I think they, there needs to be a mix of policies and incentives and, and regulation to bring down things like air pollution um, as well as traffic incidents and so on, so um, ultra low emission zones um, I think are very important in, in this as well and I think it's going to be a mix of different measures that will help us to achieve um, carbon reduction, noise reduction, um, air quality benefits, 
I don't believe there is just one policy, but I think 20 mile an hour zones is definitely in there as, as part of the mix. Um, I think it's a great question. Uh, what I particularly like about it is that it's sort of exposing the fact that um, the conversation that we're having today is, is about the sort of cities that we want to live in. Um, and you know, I've always thought that the thing that would give the single biggest boost to cycling is to uh, do away with the, the kind of the exhaust emissions that uh, cyclists have to inhale on a daily basis. So I think electric vehicles are actually part of the solution for more cycling. I think uh, 20 mile an hour zones obviously have a place as well. Um, so I think it's really about looking at um, mobility as a system across an entire city and trying to architect a sort of intelligent uh, mobility system that better suits not the needs that we've had for the previous 100 years, but the needs that we anticipate having going forward. Ian, you've obviously... Well, I'm not getting away with that one. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't want to anyway, because um, the Scots have fully endorsed a piece of work around uh, the guidance document on the introduction of 20-mile-an-hour uh, zones, which was launched in conjunction with the Scottish Government a couple of months ago. Um, well, I'll, I'll sing Scots praises again in terms of long before I was chair, they introduced the, uh, the part-time 20-mile-an-hour zones at schools, and that was driven at a local level by local authorities to change national guidance and to put those in to develop technology, to work with manufacturers, um, to develop best practice in terms of consultation with schools, with the communities, and get those in at every single school uh, across the whole of Scotland. And they've been in for a number of years now uh, and have been hugely successful in terms of they are, they are, you know, they are accepted and um, they are part and parcel of what you see when you drive around all of our, or move around all of our uh, towns and villages and cities. And at a UK level, they are now starting to catch up a little bit in terms of the, the rollout of that. Um, so yes, they, they absolutely have a, a place, a, a really important place in terms of what we do to make our towns and villages and cities more attractive places to be. It's all about the footfall that was mentioned earlier on. That's the thing we have to really focus on. The one thing I would say about introducing something on the lines of, as Edinburgh have done, a, a blanket 20 mile an hour zone, um, that will be a hard ask for them in terms of when they start to implement that and start to put that in place and start to enforce it and work with police colleagues. But I'm sure they'll stick to their guns in terms of putting it in place. Interestingly, you know, got a lot, there's a lot of media coverage on that. It's fair to say that uh, my colleagues across the border in Aberdeen City Council introduced a city centre 20 mile an hour zone, I think four or five years ago, um, at least. Uh, but not done perhaps with such a big bang effect and perhaps we haven't, it hasn't been looked at in terms of the, uh, the, the, the going back and evaluating how effective it's been. Um, but nevertheless, it, you know, it has been done elsewhere and there's, there's examples elsewhere in the country. So the last bit I'll say is really around um, the enforcement element. We do work very closely with Police Scotland colleagues. They are quite clear where their priorities will lie in terms of enforcing speed limits on the road network. And it's fair to say it will not be around necessarily 20 mile an hour zones on a broad basis, but they will work where there's particular issues within communities. So I say that's what I'm saying in terms of if you do it on such a big scale, you really have to focus it down on working with individual community councils and, and making sure you identify where the real problems area, areas are so you can then go and enforce it and reinforce that message. Make it clear to those that are passing through that area it's not acceptable. You have to take care, look for pedestrians, look for cyclists, and look for children. I'd just, I'd just have something to add, I think, in terms of electric cars and, and, and speed limits. Uh, they work much better at lower speeds than c combustion engines in terms of gearing and uh, being able to drive them at 20 mile an hour. They're very, very comfortable at that. They haven't driven hybrids around Edinburgh. Very, very easy to, 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 to drive an automatic hybrid at 20 miles an hour. It takes a wee bit more thought to drive uh, a more, a more high gear diesel, for instance, that's maybe not set up for that. So I think it's it's all part of part of the mix, and that might get around some of the arguments that there there seems to be about 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 f fuel economy uh, and emissions of, of lowering the speed limit. So hopefully we can, those two prod they, they, those two policies can come together. Um, I think we've still got time for uh, one, one last <laughs> question. I've been totally <laughs> make, make it quick. Uh, 
the short answer be yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. Travel to journey distance is a, uh, is a problem. I think the reality is that 99% of all trips taken in Britain today are achievable within the travel distance of uh, current technology on the market. So uh, sorry to hear that you're possibly in that 1% that aren't. Uh, there are other great technologies on the market that, that can address rural needs. And I think there are also people using electric vehicles in a rural context um, successfully as well. Um, and, and maybe it's that um, there is you know, a few journeys a year that aren't achievable with, that, uh, with an electric vehicle, but you know, there are other ways, other business models where you can access uh, different transport options for the, the longer journeys that need to be made. Okay. Um, Mike, okay. Sorry, yeah, just exactly. Yeah, yeah. Being a rural energy supplier, I'd feel cheated if I didn't get to uh, reply to that one. Um, obviously, Cala does 75% of our business in rural areas, so we're very aware of what the rural transport network looks like. We do a lot of work with the rural services network on service provision in general in rural areas, and transport, broadband, and energy are always the ones that come up. Um, I think you know you mentioned that the LPG that could be an option for you. You know, huge amount of our business is in rural areas. There's a lot of filling stations located in rural areas. So, auto gas hopefully is is a fuel that could serve that need. Um, our vehicles upstairs drove up from from Worcester yesterday. So without stopping. So it's a long range on those. Yeah. Okay, I'm definitely going to close the session now because people frantically waving me to the back there. Um, if we can get back within. 20 minutes or so after the, after this this the short break that would be uh, that would be great